Hey everyone, I'm Stacy Sins, your host for Coffee and Connection, and I am just so excited for you all to meet Marcy. I met Marcy, I, I was thinking about this, I think it was like eight years ago, in 2016, yeah. 2016 or 17, and I have been such a fangirl ever since, so I'm just so excited for people to get to learn about you and hear your story, and you are just changing so many lives. So Which well. is interesting because, thank you, when we met, you hadn't started Rise just yet. You were kind of bringing that to life. And to me, I was like, you're so cool. You're like doing amazing things to change things. So I have equally been fanning on you too. Oh, well, thank you. Well, oh, w w the fun question we always begin, I have so many things to, I want to talk about. I can't even get my brain to work. But focusing in, I always like to start, instead of reading your crazy, amazing bio, which is crazy, amazing, I can't wait for us to dig into it all. I like to do it a little bit different and back on up before we go forward and talk about your first job and then your current job. So tell us, you know, Marcy, what was your first job? Well, I think that there's, there's like the plain first job where I'm like, well, in high school, I worked at Sonic and I was on roller skates. They were really hard. I didn't know how to stop. I could use my hand, but a job I really loved in high school that I didn't, I got paid, but it wasn't direct is I actually did fundraising. So I was in choir wow. and I was the top seller. I don't know if you remember these, you used to get paper entertainment books and had coupons like crazy. And I talked to the local grocery store that had coupons in there and was like, can I stand outside? Cause you could give me like 20 bucks and you go in the store and save a hundred. So it was like, it was easy math. And I sold so much that I took a friend of myself on the choir trip that year. Oh so I mean, to me, I won, I won like a trip out of a job, right? That does not surprise me, given the path that you have been on. That's amazing. Now, before I move on, the roller skating at Sonic, I mean, I would have fallen on my face more times than I delivered the food. I, are you just highly coordinated? What is that about? No. No. Okay. So at the time, Skechers had a roller skate. It was cute. It was pink. It was fun. But you really only had to go almost like in a, a goalpost for a football game. Like it wasn't much that you had to go around. But what was funny about the story is the location I was at, the trash can, like the dumpster was on an incline. <laughs> and so I'm closing one night. I'm thinking I should take my shoes off. And one of the cooks was like, oh, we'll be fine. So he loads my arms up with cardboard boxes and takes the dumpster. <laughs> Stacy, he pokes me and I just go down. And about midway down, I was like, I don't know how to stop. So I just sat on the ground right by the dumpster. <laughs> that would have been me. I actually would have gone head first if we're being honest. <laughs> let's, let's, let's move along. Um, that's amazing. I love that story. That's why I love that question because it always starts on such a fun note. And currently you're doing like 4,050 amazing things. Yeah. Well, okay. So I use ChatGPT to figure out what I'm supposed to be called because I'm like, ChatGPT, I have like two things. Like, what, what do you call this? And it was like, you're a working philanthropist. And I was like, what? Ooh. I don't know, I guess. And so I have two parts to my life. I have yeah. uh, a job in cybersecurity. I work in marketing technology for one of the largest software companies in the globe. Wow. Uh, fully remote job, which gives me a lot of flexibility. I actually get volunteer time off. So some companies offer time to go volunteer. And so I'm actually a volunteer executive director for a nonprofit that I started called the Forgotten Adoption Option. That's really, well, I talk through more of this, but out of adopting a pair of siblings myself, I really want to help the other 113,000 kids that are waiting to be adopted. So I'm trying in, in different ways across the country to help find more families. Yeah. Wow. Oh, that's, I, I think what you're doing is so incredible. And, and that statistic, I, I, you know, I had heard that there are quite a few kids waiting to be adopted, but 113,000 children. Yeah. And we're both in Missouri. In Missouri, we have about 1,500 of those kids. Okay. Yeah. But na nationally, it's 100. Mm -hmm. Over 100. Mm -hmm. Wow. Now, how did you learn all this stuff? Because, you, you know, like, I'm like, how did you become such an expert in all this? I mean, I know you've been in the philanthropy world. I know you've been very impact driven for a long time. Sure. Share a little bit about the impetus to all of this. And you did, right? You shared that you adopted. Yeah, it. yeah. Well, and it's interesting. You you said, like, there's this many kids. And um, I recently have a lesson plan that goes into elementary schools for K through five students. It's based on a children's book I wrote called The You Forever Family. And when one of my teacher partners was teaching it a few weeks ago, one of the children in her class, third grade class, said, so teacher, where are these kids? Like, where are they? Where can I find them? And such a precious question, yes. Stacey, because as the teacher responded, they're all around us. They're in our schools. They're our neighbors. Like they're, they're, And that's why I've named the organization the Forgotten Adoption Option, because these kids are all around us. Like yeah. they are everywhere, but we don't necessarily see them or see that opportunity. And so really, 
if I'm really honest with you, Stacey, a lot of what drew me into this space was anger. Because oh, when my, my early 20s, I went overseas um, to a country called Moldova and I served in an orphanage. I worked a lot of that week with the older teen girls. And in Moldova, um, this is a very sad story, uh, parents drop their children off at the orphanage because they're not able to provide for them. Oh, wow. So kids are there because they have a mom and dad or a yeah. mom, whatever that is, and they can't be fed or provided for. And so the natural trajectory is actually really similar to what happens to kids that age out of the foster care system in the States. Oh, Girls wow. tend to go into prostitution in Moldova and boys go into incarceration. In the States, you might think, find things like homelessness, yeah. drug use, all, a, a few more layers to that. And after that trip, Stacey, when I came back to the States, I remember being so upset. And there was a particular girl, her name's Elena. She was 16 at the time. And I'm like early 20s. And I'm thinking, logically, I can't really adopt you. But man, I want to. And how do I reconcile this? And I got really mad because I thought this is not fair. Like, first, okay. you should be with your, your biological family. That's the unfair part. But what's also unfair is that I wouldn't spend time with you this summer. But just in a few years, you have no, you have no ability to overcome the future for yourself. Like yes. who's going to be there for you? And so that was kind of my moment of I'm going to adopt. Yes. Like, that's how I'm going to solve this problem is I'm going to choose adoption as my plan A. And so fast forward, when my husband and I started dating, our relationship moved really quickly. And I was like, hey, just so you know, I don't want to have biological children. Kind of expected to be like, great, we're breaking up. But instead <laughs> I said, no, um, I want you to. And I was like, what? And he was like, well, my grandpa was born in the 20s. He was um, he immigrated with his family from Serbia to the States. Wow. And when Sam was seven, his mom and dad died of pneumonia because healthcare is a very different thing. Yes. And so Sam's two older siblings um, get taken in by a family, what's called like working help. So they they were adopted, but they actually helped on a farm. Got okay. it. Sam seven, probably going through a lot of trauma and grief and all the things because you've lost your family and you've moved in their country, all these things. And he's really rough around the edges. And he grows up on the streets. Wow. So really amazing American dream story that kind of comes out of him starting as a business and so forth. But my husband said, I'm a hundred percent aligned that we adopt, but I like the older kid thing. I want them to be in our backyard. And I was like, how do I do that? So that's really what led me to learn all these things is, is adopting place. overseas where you had been. Okay. Yeah. So I had to learn all the things and it took me about five years. Like we, we didn't know when we got married, how soon we wanted to have children. We were like, well, if they're not going to be babies, Maybe we think through how old we are versus our peers yeah. and, and kind of fitting in a little bit that way. Um, but it's seriously, I mean, the internet's changed quite a bit since then. It's been you know, married almost 17 years, but it took about five years to even figure out I could do this, which goes back to the forgotten adoption option. Like it's not prevalently known. Yeah. When you do this, a lot of people think, oh, I know someone that's a foster parent. They help kids, you know, get, go back with their biological families. And that's very admirable, but they don't know. Cause I didn't want to be a foster parent. I, I didn't want to have to be that middle person, that family. I wanted to take kids and keep them. Yes. And there is another track within foster care where you can just say, I would like to adopt. And most people don't know that. Yeah. I had no idea. And so you can ha help a child who's in the foster care and it's not this in between will I or won't I. Right. Unknown okay. because we yeah. think of foster care as, oh, that's temporary. But yeah. then you have all 113,000 kids that today they're living in a foster home, a residential facility, what have you. Legally, their state is their parent on paper, which sounds really bogus. Yeah. But either A, people like you and me go through the training and adopt them, or B, a few years from now, they become the children who age out of the system that we hear about. They're 18, they're 21 years old in their state, all of their supports are removed, and then they're the ones that are, are part of this really sad reality where homelessness hits and criminal activity and things like that, where it's really difficult for them to be able to get a leg up. Wow. And so it took you five years to figure out how to yourself bring someone into your family. And then you were able to have two children. Yeah, we, so I wanted a very large family, Stacey. Yeah. My, my parents have a lot of siblings. And so I thought that's what I will do. I had, I have three sisters, yeah. but my husband, and I never talked about that. So, <laughs> other really big things, which is the I mean, that's so yeah. Wonderful, Marcy. <laughs> yeah, yeah. And so he said max of two. Okay. And so I said, great, we'll say up to two. Because <laughs> if we're going to get them, like, because I was like, if I think about myself in that scenario, I could not imagine being ripped apart from a sibling. Yeah. But we were actually very open to sibling pairs from the get go and open to individual kids too. And so, yeah, our kids, we met, my daughter was a week from turning three. 
My okay. son was four and their biological siblings there. That's kind of an edge case. Uh, they are a five hour drive away from where I live. So we're still the same state, but they're from like a rural community. And okay. yeah, that's, and, wow. and there's a great need. I've, I've come to learn because of that path that there's a very great need to adopt siblings. Yes. Well, and so since then you have been on this mission, it sounds like, you know, you've written a book, you, uh, you've done so much. Tell us how that evolution was. I mean, being a mom of two, that in itself is quite a lot. But Which is you, fun, right? Because I was a mom of zero one night and the next day, and it was Mother's Day weekend at that. So it was like, oh, look, I know, I don't know anything, but now I'm supposed to know everything. And so, <laughs> well, what happened, Stacey, is when my kids moved in, so um, we were their seventh placement. And again, young ages, so you can just imagine. And so they were like, okay, we totally know this is just legal time. Yes. It should take about four months. This is like the state talking to us. Yes. And we, you can't predict things like a legal process, right? So sure. say we are nine months in and there's no adoption date on the calendar. And there's a lot of talk of like, well, we don't even know if this is going to happen now. And I'm like, so put my kids to bed because you say face in front of your kids, right? Of course, of course. Put my kids in bed. I am on my bathroom floor in a puddle of tears about right. woe is me. This is really hard. Why did I do this? Why on earth did I not have biological children? Which is interesting with the nine month mark, right? Yeah. That I'm like, yeah. I, I could have been like packing it back to the hospital and I don't even know what's going on in my life right now. Yes. And it was like someone tapped me on the shoulder, Stacey. Mm -hmm. This isn't about you. And I did not want to hear whatever that thing wanted to say to me, but I was like, but it is about me. Like, yeah. this is so hard. Yeah. And I, I I, kind of just started thinking through, well, maybe there's a silver lining. Maybe there's like a why or a what. And so my husband's an artist. Oh. We have a home studio. So I go in the basement and I was like, I have an idea. I think this is on purpose. And perhaps the delay that we're experiencing is because we can help other people see these kids. And yeah. we can do that by sharing the journey we as parents are facing. Because I was like, I don't want to see another blog where you get to hear the stuff. Like, you don't need to hear about my kids or their past or their bio. Like, you, you don't need to hear any of that. That's none of your business, right? Right. And so we agreed. No bad talking to the bio family. No explaining why our kids were in care. But I had the freedom to blog. And it became a great outlet because our process took another nine months. Wow. And so really what happened, Stacey, is without knowing it, I was mentoring other people. I was educating them on who these kids are. And in turn, I, once we finalized our adoption, people started reaching out because like the, when they, it was the blog, they weren't really communicating, but I could see they were reading it. So I was like, who are you? But once we finalized, they reached out and said, will you teach me? Yeah. So after my kids went to bed, they'd come over for like two hours and it, it sounded rocky because it's not a straight path. It's like, you have to have grit and then this happens, and then you have to persevere and then you got to follow up, but this is how you do it. Cause you have to be the one to advocate for the kids. And that's really what happened. And then when the pandemic hit, we couldn't have people in our home anymore. So friends up in Michigan, they were like, we have friends here. You should do Zoom. And I was like, I'm open. <laughs> and when we got the stimulus payments, I didn't know what to do with the money. My husband and I both were employed. And so after some thinking through that, I asked him, hey, what if I could write down all these conversations we've been having where we're just teaching people a process? What if that could be given to the entire country? I'm not limited to our living room. I'm not limited to meeting people on Zoom. What if we could teach our country? And that's really what, what started a lot of kind of the, the current day. I've got three books now. One just came out last November called What to Know When You Adopt Through Foster Care. Because a lot of families that I coach and meet with, it's kind of experienced different unique scenarios. And they're like, who's been through this? And I yeah. usually connect them with a friend. Um, so this particular book, I've pulled out all of the identifying piece of information. And you can hear their stories without knowing who they are. Because you can gleam kind of how to handle these things and what to expect. Um, also made a blog, uh, finished the blog, made an app. Um, and then I mentioned the lesson plan earlier. So really what my intention is, is Stacey, this is like a very, very basic business plan. <laughs> if we can reach more people, we can find more families and that's it. But you're so entrepreneurial. It's interesting to see, like you took this really challenging time laying in your bathroom, you know, in tears and you have created this super entrepreneurial journey. And I think there's so many people out there listening who want to change lives. They just don't know what it looks like and how to go about it and how to reach millions. And you're doing that. You're on this mission doing that. And even got to be on Kelly Clarkson. I did. I did, which was pretty wild. So I was, um, this is a really sweet story. So 
Pilot Pen, like the gel pen company, we all think they have erasable pens. They have lots of great products, but they do an annual competition to find someone, an adult, they call them an overachiever, a G2 overachiever. Yeah, and that's my, <laughs> they define overachiever as you have a day job and you're helping the community. So yeah, that's okay. what, okay, they call it an overachiever. Chat GPT calls me a working philanthropist, I, you know, whatever. Okay, <laughs> cool. So my husband hand writes this 12 page in their G2 pen. Cause they're a pen cup, you know, like you got it. Yeah. So yeah. he hand writes a nomination for me and it's his grandpa. So it's this beautifully written nomination. And of course the day it's due uh, is when we're trying to upload it. And it's also around the holidays, family are in town. Of course the website's not working, but you don't, you don't like contact them. Cause like that's, you know, so anyway, yeah. I'm stuck in the house trying to upload the file while he's doing family stuff and I catch up later. And then that was that Stacy. Like we thought, okay, we, we, you yeah. know, you can't, you can't find an opportunity if you don't put yourself in that situation. And I got a call last year about this time, actually an email letting me know I was one of 10 finalists and I was asked with it because you're an overachiever. I had yeah. seven days to make a 10 minute video with specific questions. So I had an incredible troop of friends behind the scenes that introduced me to technologies that reviewed that video like crazy. A friend that's in the media industry helped me understand how to think like I was in the media yeah. industry. So it was tight and it was powerful. And I want, I wanted to win Stacey. Like if oh, I made yes, a chat so. bar, like I wanted to shine. So I got a call um, a few, I guess, weeks later telling me, and they didn't tell me if I won or not, but they told me they wanted to have me as a guest on the Kelly Clarkson show. We got all the details lined up. It was going to be a really cool week because I was graduating and the speaker at my graduation and my reading program was launching, but we were going to fit this in because I was like, you do not get this opportunity, right? No, Kelly Clarkson, nobody figured out. Like, I know, you just, you just arrange things. You just, you just go. And my, my yeah. employer was so supportive, but then the writer's strike happened. Oh, <gasps> So I had literally checked into my flight and about an hour later, I get an email saying, uh, this is postponed indefinitely. Oh, that would so, be like soul crushing. <laughs> yeah. So I may have been like really adamantly checking the news on a daily basis, I would imagine. Here, which I would not have ever really like that would have been in my scope. Right. And so right. about a couple weeks into that, Stacey, one of the things I had told Pilot Penn, so they give away $100,000 to this winner. And one of the things that I told them in the video of how I would use the funds to make an impact is I had another book on my heart and that's the book that came out last November. And so a couple weeks into the writer's strike, I don't, I don't know that I won. I'm hoping I won, but you don't know. And who knows how long and whatever. And so I talked to my husband and I said, I know that regardless, because I'm an entrepreneur, this process taught me, it showed me a need that I need to make happen. And what I don't have is time. What we don't have is time. These kids don't need to wait until a strike is over for right. us to talk about them, right? So I said, can we just like personally fund this? And if it works out, we reimburse ourselves. And if we don't, like we have a book that talks about the kids that we know we need to, to do. So I spent last summer uh, collaborating with over like 30 friends to get the book written and had it actually debuted and it was mentioned on the Kelly Clarkson show. So no. yeah, yeah. Yeah, it was so rad. So they flew me to New York. Um, my husband couldn't go, unfortunately, but I got to have a, a solo trip. I went and saw Michael Jackson, the musical, which was amazing oh. while I was there. And yeah, I got up really early. I had the best hair and makeup experience. They oh, sat me sure. into my room and I got to be interviewed with the director of marketing from Pilot Pen. Oh. And on the show, they told me that I was the winner, which was incredible like I was completely speechless like you would have thought I would have like thought through what to do in that moment but I, I didn't know like well, I didn't know I just knew like I, I was there it was amazing were you so nervous I don't know no. if I, would have... I had so much fun well Stacey I've really been working in my headspace a lot through the work that I do about being present and like savoring things because it Stacey this is once in a lifetime okay oh, right. like, I'd love to go back Kelly if you're listening right I'd love to go back <laughs> But like, those, <laughs> yeah, but like those things don't happen. You get yeah. one chance. And, and that's really what I could even see as I was working through that writer's strike, learning how to be patiently excited and quietly excited, which to me are really weird, but good skills. Like yeah. that I knew stuff, but I had an NDA. So like I could, I could, I could work with it in my heart, but I couldn't like go on social and and do those things. And so I actually had asked myself in advance, like, okay, you're probably going to have like a minute with Kelly. That's it. You're gonna have a minute. What are you going to talk about? And I couldn't quite figure it out, but I was like, what I'm not going to do is have a shallow conversation because what you don't do is spend a minute with a person that you'll probably never get a chance to do it with again and ask something that everyone else has asked her. Yes. And so after having this, I seriously had the best hair and makeup experience that morning. Like the person that came, she was so encouraging. So we connected on so many levels and spiritually 
And so when I sat on the couch and Kelly says hello, and we're just getting this segment set up, I looked at her and I said, how early do you do hair and makeup? Because I had to get up. I had to get up. At, like it was, I think I'd be ready by six. Right. Certain time. Okay. So that's like crazy. And my hair had to be blow dry, all that stuff. Yeah. And she told me she waits to the very last minute. And I said, what? And she said, my, my mascara irritates my eyes. I hate wearing it. <laughs> You would never know that. You would never know that. So I was like, Kelly, you need to get a makeup line. Like that's, <laughs> that's what you, so like, but like what a cool conversation to have, yes. right? It's a human real moment you had with yes. her. Yes. Yes. Connecting as a human, I think is one of the best things and something you're so brilliant at. Oh, that's very sweet. It was so much fun. It was, and yeah. it was in their new studio. So during the writer's strike, the Kelly Collection show moved from LA over to New York. So okay. the trip then got, yeah, I got to go to a different city, which was really, really neat. But, but to me, again, it, it, it's, it's a very simple math equation. Like the audience, and that's what I focused on the whole time. I was like, I don't care if I win the grant at all. They're yes. giving me an opportunity to talk to the entire country yes. in a very positive way, which is really what these kids need. And that's really been my mission is I think sometimes there's a stigma with foster care that can kind of, we want to excuse me, like turn our heads, right. Or maybe just like yes. not talk about it because it feels kind of heavy or weighty or icky. And I'm out to change that because I'm like, I have two of these kids and I love my kids. And you know what? Like you just said, they're humans. Yes. And we need to remember humans and we yes. need to understand that kids that are kids today, tomorrow are teens. And the next day they're adults and we need these adults in our community because they've got great ideas and they're tenacious people and they've been through a lot. And man, their stories inspire. Like there's, there's just so much value there. Well, and think about the grit and resilience. Yes. You can help them and just the butterfly effect of what you're doing, right? I mean, exactly. these kids. Yeah. And, and so you have been doing this work now for how many years? Well, like, I guess formally since the pandemic. Yeah. So I guess we're like on year four. I mean, I adopted my kid. I, I lose track because I, I froze my age. Yeah, I'm like, there's, there, it's all, it's all in there. But I think well, it's just natural when you do th something, right? Like, I mean, as you, like. I can yeah. be like, okay, so Stacey, so how long has it been that you've you totally. know, started things? And it's like, well, I've kind of always been doing that, you know? Right. Well, what goes through my mind is, you know, you've had so much success. We haven't even touched on the fact that you're Mrs. Ohio. I mean, that's such a fun thing, which I do want to touch on, but we're going to hold that thought. But you've done so many things and accomplished so much. And I think that's great, but that that's like the highlight reel. I'm curious, mm -hmm. as you've been navigating this, you know, how have you kept going through the hard moments? Because oh, I yeah. imagine that there are a ton of hard moments and, oh, yeah. and disappointing moments. I mean, this is something so real and so visceral. You know, it's not a gadget that you're creating mm -hmm. or an app, right? That when you have setbacks, it's an app. These are kids' lives, right? And so when you have mm -hmm. setbacks or challenges, I bet that just is such a heavy experience. So how do you keep going? And what has that been like? Well, I think for one, Stacey, because yeah, like rejection is common. Okay. Oh. And I think I think one thing that I've learned is actually to anticipate it. So oh. when whenever throwing my name in for anything or asking or whatever, I always play out what if I do and what if I don't? Like what if they say no? What if they say yes? And I prepare for both versions of that. And I think what it actually stems from is when my husband and I adopted before we were matched with our kids, this is an interesting backstory. So we had um, found a different pair of siblings who were a little bit older. I think they were like 10 and 11. We went through extra training to meet their needs. And I pushed and pushed and pushed and pushed on the social worker because it was taking forever. And the backstory on these kids, Stacey, is they had already been in a family that was going to adopt them. Okay. And then because of how we write the things that we write in, in our legislature, um, the adoptive mom. So you have to, in Missouri, you have to live with a family that adopts you for six months before you can go to court. Okay. Okay. And it's the same, like even infant adoption, like you might take the baby home from the hospital, but you still got to wait. Okay. So during that six month period, future adoptive mom gets cancer and the state decided that's a terminal illness. And these kids would be better off in the foster care system than to be adopted by a family that might lose their mom, which to me is quite ridiculous. Cause if I got cancer today, you're not taking my kids away. Okay. Yeah. So that's the backstory. Okay. So these kids I learned about, we fought for them. We interviewed for them. We're one of two families in the whole state of Missouri that interviews. Yeah. We take off work. We've never met the kids, Stacey. We've only read profiles and papers and so forth. Yeah. And that afternoon I get a phone call. Marcy, I want to let you know you weren't picked. Says our social worker. And I could feel it in my eyes and I could feel it in my stomach, Stacey. Yeah. That hurt. Like that hurt. Yeah. Like the disappointment of that. But I thought... I'm not going to say that on the phone right now. And so out of my mouth, I said, I'm so glad that we got to help them move forward. 
And I'm so glad they have a family. And I, I wasn't crying. I like held my breath. Totally. And she was like, we're going to give you some time. Take your time. We don't have to talk about any of this for a while. Click. And I just sit on the floor. Oh. And, I, and my husband comes over and he was like, okay, we should stress eat. What do you want? And I was like, Oreos. And he was like, pizza. So he heads to the grocery store. I and love him. I know. He's so great. So we had upstairs. We we're going to watch a movie to just, you know, not do anything. And while he's gone at the store, Stacy, I opened my email. And that's actually how I learned about our kids. Because they had no picture. They had a small paragraph. And it, and this is how archaic kind of some of the system is. It had been forwarded to about seven other people before it got to us that are like social workers. And so when I opened it, it said it's due tomorrow. And so my husband's at the store and I was like, be ready for anything. <laughs> and he gets home and he was like, what does this even mean? I explained, he goes, you sent the email, didn't you? And I was like, no, but I drafted it. And he was like, we I need to sleep on it. And I was like, no, 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 tomorrow. It says tomorrow, our social workers got stuff to do. So I say all of that because on the outside, you can think, oh, oh, Marcy, you adopted these, these kids. They're great. They're wonderful. Yeah, we have rejection. And there's so much rejection in this space. I, I know that there's, it, it's hard. Like, and I think it, to answer your question more specifically, I think what helps me a lot is I have great sounding boards in my life. Um, people that I can go to that I'm like, Ooh, you know, and I've learned to take less and less of it personal and just continuously yeah. remember why I'm doing this. And it's really because my husband won't let me adopt the 10 kids I want. And so if I can help more kids, like his grandfather get adopted like that, I feel called to do that. And so I realized that there's learning along the way and it's not going to be perfect. And I think just like, I think the technology career that I have has really taught me that, that, yeah. Just try it anyway, because what's the worst thing that can happen, right? Like yes. you could fail in front of people and if they're going to make fun of you and, and that happens sometimes, right? You oh. get out there and you hear that feedback, right? Oh, yeah. And what I've constantly been telling myself around that space, Stacey, is did you go do that? <laughs> did I see you? I, I'm not telling them that, right? But it's like. They're thinking you know, about like, didn't see you right. on Clarkson. <laughs> right. And so it's like, you know what? Like until you can tell me that you put yourself or tried that or took that risk, like it's kind of invalid that you totally. want to correct what I'm doing or, you know, and, and it's beautiful because there's, there's so many people that want to partner in this space. I've had a family that feels like they don't, they're, they have, they're empty nesters. They don't feel like they want to be adding to their family size, but they really want to help. And so they actually helped fund mattresses for a sibling group that was getting adopted. And so like, there's beautiful ways to connect people in this space. And it's to me just so interesting and neat to be able to be kind of a conduit of like, I've been there. I want to help you. Um, so yeah, I think just expecting the rejection has really helped me. Like just assuming that like, I might have a great idea and it might not go well and being okay adjusting, right? Like yeah. I have a research study I'm in the midst of doing on families like me that are non-kin that adopt through the foster care system. I don't need a PhD. There's really no value in my industry for that, but I'm basically doing a dissertation. Yeah. But when I was trying to kick things off with a couple of research partners last year, I was in the middle of finishing an MBA and I just sensed that like, I can't do all these things at once. I can do them, just not at once. And so yeah. to talk to my team to say, hey, I need to push us back about six months. This is why. And then being like, we're adaptable people. Of course, we're going to support you, Mercy. So like, I think that the reciprocation of people that are that are accepting, that understand people, right? Like we can adjust as people. Like we can move deadlines. We can change yeah. what the end game is. Like it's all okay. So I think a lot of that is really what helps me be yeah. flexible and, and just kind of accept rejection. Well, and I think that's very applicable, whether you're doing what you're doing or starting some other company. I mean, all of that I think is, is beneficial. And before I go forward, I want to go back a bit. You talked about how you have put in work about being more present. Mm -hmm. I think that's something as an entrepreneur, let me just speak for myself. When I was building the companies I was building, I was always so forward thinking mm. that I was never in the moment really appreciating or really being proud, honestly, of what I had done in that moment. Like I look back at some of the things that we, the lives we changed with Rise and just some of the things we got right. And I'm just like, ah, oh, that's so great from a nostalgia stand, you know, being nostalgic. But yeah. In that moment, I was far from present and I was hyper focused on all the things we were doing wrong because I did a lot of things wrong and always looking forward towards the next thing. And so what I'm hearing you say is you've done some work to not be that way. So mm -hmm. I'm sure if I could go back in time and have that skill, I think that's so valuable. So I want to hear, did that come natural and what did you do? <laughs> <laughs> I don't think it came natural. I think what it came naturally out of is time management. 
and energy management. Okay. So, so for instance, I have this hybrid life and I've experimented with, should I be full-time in my social, like the social enterprise world? And I keep coming back to no, and I don't know why, but what it teaches me, I don't have unlimited time to do the impactful work I want to do. Right. Like I know where I have time. I know how to use five minutes really well. And there's, there's some sort of like theory about like the the marginal gains theory, I think is what it's called formally. We're like, you know, I, I call it like five or 10 minutes, a couple times a week is going to get something a lot further than never working on it. Right. Totally. And I think for me out of time management and energy management, and just kind of recognizing I've really got to be really organized about how I do this. And I think that even stemmed out of in the philanthropy world I used to work in, there was a big movement about helping donors understand that like you can make more impact if you focus on a few organizations or one versus 20 like there's a lot of dollars to go around from a from a fundraising standpoint right and i think i've really brewed with that information yeah. going i think what they're actually telling us is if you focus you can make a deep impact and yeah. if you're broad you can make an impact right but if you focus and that's all i've done i've focused i've focused on a single thing that's meaningful to me and i've kept focus, but I've also had limited time. And you could say, well, that's kind of, that, that, that sounds kind of negative mercy. It's not, it's just honest. Like yeah. I don't have unlimited resources to myself. Well, you should hire staff and you should this, but I've actually been questioning even the nonprofit, how I'm operating, what I'm doing on its head, because I don't, I, I've been in situations working in smaller nonprofits where I was the one taken into the CEO's office of, Hey, we, ha- I don't know that we can be payroll because of the timing of some of these yeah. government grants. Can you be the one to hold on? Which is an icky conversation. Yes. And what I, what I learned as the person, as the fundraiser in those stories is I never, and in, in the work that I do, I never want money or timing of money to be a reason why I can't do what I, I feel called mm-hmm. to do. And so everything that I do, that's why I volunteer my time, because then my pay is tied to a different, completely different thing, right? And, and so I think with with being present and, and realizing emotional energy, right, is I have goals around the kind of mom I want to be. I have goals around the kind of worker and wife I want to be. I have goals around what matters and how I do the work that I do. Like my children's book, Stacey, my husband, as I mentioned before, he's an artist. Okay. So a natural thing is you hire your husband or just get him to draw the pictures. It's like really affordable, right? It's like pro bono. (laughs) That makes sense until you realize his art form right now is 3d miniatures to play Dungeons and Dragons with. All right. He doesn't draw like he, he can draw, but like, he doesn't like illustrate. Okay. Right. So, and, and he even came to me and said, I looked at all these books in the foster care space and there, there's some very well-meaning ones, some really beautiful ones, but what's not a common thing in this space, Stacey, is beautiful, thoughtful content, just content. Okay. And so he was like, I'm not doing it. I'm going to be a B quality artist for you. And these kids don't need that. And I think he comes from a space that that's grandpa Sam. He doesn't need someone that's trying, has a good heart. He's like, go find the person with the skill. Like I will be there to help you critique the artwork and, and, and like he serves as my creative director. But I think just recognizing and being okay that sometimes that means I need to go crowdfund yeah. to take care of things I want, but also recognizing I have a limited amount of time. So I really think a lot about the efficiency of that so that I can be present where I'm going, right? So when I'm invited right now to be with you, like I don't have my Apple Watch on, why? Because I didn't want the interruption. Like I have different things closed behind me. I don't want my dog's barking, right? Like I wanna really be able to focus and connect with you. And those mm-hmm. are small things. Yeah, but, but I, 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 I have to make a big deal, make a big impact. Right, right, but I took the mental time and it only took a few minutes to think, okay, how do I wanna show up right now for the next hour of my life, right? Like. How do I want that to feel and be so that I can really be focused in where I am? There's, there's, you know, lots of vision, of course, I could, but that can park for right now, right? Like I can think about that stuff later. Say that again, the questions you ask yourself, because I want other people to be able to ask themselves that. And I think that is, because mm. everyone's like being present, being present, like, you know, you're supposed to do that, but like, I need tactical things to be able to do that. So again, repeat what you just said about the questions yeah. you ask yourself. Yeah. That's- okay. So powerful. Well, I'm going to give it to you in an analogy. Okay. So as a little kid, this might resonate with some people as a little kid, you might've like played with dolls or something. Okay. And I'm sure you set the scene, right? Like you, you had like accessories or you got the car or whatever. Like there was like an action happening. Okay. Yeah. Or as an adult, I, I spent a lot of time in my nonprofit career in event planning. So yeah. we did a lot about like who's sitting with who and what are we having to eat? And, and like, you had to run a show. Okay. So if you're like a theater person, you know exactly what I'm talking about. That's all I'm doing with my own life. Okay. So how do I, what run of show is in my head? 
how am I setting the scene so that if you will, as an adult, I can play with Stacy right now. I want to, I want to engage with the adult friend that I have yes. in a way that's meaningful with her. And so it's just taking a few minutes and it could have been while I was in the shower. I do a lot of thinking men. Yes. Yes. Or it might be while I'm driving somewhere, whatever it is, but I'm taking time in my mind. I think there's so much space in there sometimes that we can clog it with worrying and sometimes maybe fretting or, or overthinking, right? Yeah. And I, I luckily, I am very fortunate. I have a friend that if I get stuck in the I can't decide which one, I go to her and she is like, this is the one go. Yeah. So I, totally. I have that friend, which really helps. So I think because of that, I get the space in my mind, which everyone can have it. Everyone has it. It's just taking the moment to ask yourself, like, how do I want to show up? And maybe you're thinking, oh, Marce, it's easy for you to say because I'd be thinking about my hair. I'd be thinking about my makeup. I'd be thinking about my nose. Whatever the thing is you don't like, like there's so much to distract us, but that's okay. That's just who you are. Like you're going to show up anyway. So like, just try to be like yes. in your mind, in your heart. And that, I think that's where a lot of it stems for me, Stacey, is I just, I try to live from my heart. Yes. And whether sometimes I can overthink are the words right, but I'm like, but if I'm speaking from my heart, I'm going to trust that it's going to turn out okay. Yeah. You know, if I'm coming from a place of genuineness, yeah. it's all going to work out. Even if I have to go apologize later or yeah. correct something, I just need to do it anyway. You know? Yes. I love that. How do I want to show up? I'm going to work yeah. on that. I think that's amazing. Instead of thinking about the 10 things that I still need to do or whatever it is, how do I want to show up in this meeting? Yes. I love that. Well, you know, something that I from afar was so impressed by, you know, that... <laughs> This adult that never did pageantry, what is pageantry? You know, as someone that you know, it's it, what I what I thought was so fascinating watching you win Miss o Mrs. Ohio. It, it's something I I didn't know a lot about that world. I didn't know it was something I didn't either that you aspired <laughs> to do. But it's so fun seeing you just going out there and doing these really cool things and not letting anything get on your way and 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 doing what fills your cup. So tell me about that journey. Like what sparked your interest and what has that been like? What have you learned? I Which is fun from the outside because you're like, it just looks like you went. And I'm like, no, 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 no. I said no the whole time. Like I went kicking and screaming the whole time because the, the, the scenario is, Stacey, it's like on the brink of vacation. My family's heading to Kentucky. We're going to drive there. We're packed. I'm in bed. Okay. I'm exhausted from packing. And this little voice, and it's the same little voice that tapped my shoulder. I recognize the voice. Okay. It said pageantry. <laughs> and I rolled over with my pillow and I was like, you got the wrong number. And then it said, get up for 15 minutes and you go Google that. And I was like, no, yeah. no, you yeah. got, no, no. Well, I did anyway. Okay. okay. And I, I am very financially conscious. I'm a good steward of resources. And I learned that in Missouri at the time for the passion I started with, um, they were waiving all fees and I didn't realize how kind of expensive some of this stuff is. And so I was like, so now I can't even say I don't want to do it because it costs money. <laughs> so. I talked to my family and I didn't really understand anything that I was saying yes to, except for pageantry. That's all, that's all, that's like all I knew, Stacey, like that much. Okay. <laughs> so I tell my kids, I go social media public. I immediately get a response from an entrepreneur friend, Jennifer Bonacorsi. Corsi. She runs a jewelry company called J Bloom. She private messages me and says, I'm going to be your jewelry sponsor. And I was like, I need one of those. Okay. So like I'm learning all this as we go. I, I talked to the director. Uh, I'm so glad it was a phone call. Because she's explaining to me what I need to buy and these five inch heels and how there's a swimsuit competition. And I think my mouth is like, but she can't see any of that. So I'm just like, oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> what on earth did I just say yes to? And my husband gave up the phone and he was like, so you go buy the shoes. And I was like, okay, here we okay, go. Okay. Yeah. So what yeah. happened? So yeah, I got to reign as United States of America's Mrs. Ohio 2022. So what happened is um, after participating with the Missouri um, pageant that I was part of, had a really interesting experience. I did a lot of crazy cool stuff in six weeks. I was on a billboard. I, I did I did visits around my city. Like I was like, if we're going to do this and this is where I go, right? This is yeah. once in a lifetime. Like I don't need to go back and be a veteran at this. I just need to like do it and do it well and learn fast. And so um, I had been um, reached out to a couple of days later to look at a different pageant system. And I looked and they didn't have Missouri available. Someone else had already been invited to do that. And so I was like, well, I can't do it. And I made the mistake of telling a coworker this. And she said, Marcy, I need you to tell me how you're going to do this. And my response to her was, I hate you. <laughs> 
<laughs> totally get it. You yeah. gotta love and hate those people in your life. Yes. And so she was like, we're not talking. And I was like, fine, fine. <laughs> so I, I look at the roster. There's a few places like Hawaii was a choice. But Stacey, I'm not, I, I don't feel like I can, I, I can really represent Hawaii. Okay. First, I'd love to go, but like a little, little hard. Okay. Yeah. But I was like, Ohio, I can make a case for that. So I talked to a sister, I talked to a friend that lives there, and they both were over the moon, excited, thought it was a great idea. My friend is a mom blogger. She seriously, after school, rallied like so many moms. They were going to vote and have a huddle. She calls me, Marcy, we talked. Yeah, what'd she say? We just need to know if you're a Michigan fan. I was like, I don't follow football. She was like, okay, we're behind you. And I was like, why? Why <laughs> is this okay? I'm wanting someone to tell me that I'm nuts, right? Yeah. And the Dave Thomas Foundation for Adoption, my family partnered with the Dave Thomas Foundation when we adopted our kids. They have um, really great templates that you can use to, to advocate for yourself with your employer to have adoption benefits. And we use those. So yeah. I've been a, a strong partner with them for years. They're based in Ohio. Um, yeah. So Wendy's Restaurant, the founder, uh, Dave Thomas, was adopted through foster care. That's how this all starts. Oh, and wow. I asked them if it's okay. And they're like, you don't live here, work here, go to school here. Like, how is this okay? And I was like, I don't know. Um, and so again, presented an opportunity. And um, at this time I decided that, okay, this is nationals. This isn't state anymore. This is nationals. I was going to Vegas. Um, so I have great, wonderful friends that brainstorm and are actionable. And so they were like, you need to put a budget. Like you need to think of everything you've ever wanted. And I was like, I don't even know. And they're like, no, like you, you need to like allow yourself, allow yourself to think like that. So I did, I needed like 10 grand to go to have coaching, the, the wardrobe, all the things. Um, and about a week later I had every single dollar so I could focus. And this is where like your mindset, right? Like I, fo I focused a week on the fundraising so I could then go. Um, I learned so much through pageant coaching. I learned about what is called a God sized dream, which is really letting yourself think big, like just letting yourself dream big. Like that was a huge thing for me. I also learned there was a forum before I had my coaching sessions. And one of the boxes you would check is, are you willing to be coachable? And I consented every time, but it, 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 it really has stuck with my mind, Stacey, about how do we consent to things? Like, can, can I show up? Right. Can yes. I show up ready to be challenged? Like that, that was a flip of mindset for me. And so, uh, Part of pageant coaching was, okay, what's a realistic goal in this space? And by the way, Marcy, most pageant queens either write a book or have a podcast. And I was like, what do you do if you've already done those things? <laughs> and they were like, oh, um, well, what do you think God's calling you to do? And I was like, thanks. That's great. But I knew, I knew right away because I was like, they were like, how are you uniquely gifted? And I was like, I know tech. I need to make an app. I see it. It's going gonna, it's gonna to happen. Um, so what I focus on, cause I, in my head, like you want to compete for the national crown, right? Yeah. Stacey, I don't have, I don't have the, 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 the resume on this. Okay. Like I've done lots of cool things. Sure. But like, realistically, I don't know. I don't know that I have like all the poses down. Okay. <laughs> I don't know that my goal is to be a model because right. under all of this to kind of give the backstory to you, what I've been searching for and is what I search for is how do I find a positive spotlight to put these kids in? That's what I chase, okay? It's like a lightning bug. I love lightning bugs. How do I chase? And that's I think that's why pageantry came up. It's yeah, positive. I'm glad you said that. Because at first, on the surface, it feels random, right? It does. It does. There's something behind this. <laughs> you're saying that. Say that again. The question you ask yourself is, how can yeah. I? How can I put a positive spotlight on the kids waiting to be adopted? So I was, I'm looking, I'm always looking for positive spotlights. And, and as a kid, I just remember playing with lightning bugs and loving their glow, like just being mesmerized by that. And that's really what I'm looking for. Like kids chase that. Kids love most, most of them, right? And so to me, it's like, how can I be associated with positive things yes. so that kids can be seen in a positive light? It's the same theme, right? Mm -hmm. So I knew that winning a national crown would be cool, but like, really, I don't know. Okay. So I, I prepared for it. Like I was going to win. I made a folder on my computer with the national title. I worked ahead of my graduate school work so I could have time in case I won. Like I, I prepared, like I was going to win. Okay. But what I knew I could focus on going back to selling those entertainment books. Yeah. I, I wanted to win people's choice. Cause I thought that that's a game to be played. Like I, I, I know <laughs> Yes. yes. And part of the prize there was you got um, like a $3,000 grant to the charity of your choice. And I was like, that's perfect. Like that, that, that's all I'm in this for anyway, folks, like cool with the dresses and stuff, but like that, I don't really care. Okay. Like I, I'm not, that's just not my thing. Okay. I, yes. I learned a skill to be in a place. Okay. Yes. And I did, I, I set a record. Uh, I won 6,000 votes in that competition. Oh. Yeah. And so I walked away, I placed in the top 16, 
Uh, I came back from nationals and because I had prepared, like I was winning, cause that's what you should do. Okay. I had a week where I didn't have schoolwork. I didn't have, like, I, I had worked ahead in case there were like media things I needed to be at. And Stacey, that's actually where I had this like, oh, I need to be a responsible moment because I had time. I had intentionally yeah. made time yeah. to do something that wasn't wasn't a commitment. And that's really what led me into writing my children's book. Cause I thought that's something I've 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 been inspired by. Are you my mother? The sweet children's book for a long time. And I hadn't, I it just never quite came. The story never really came. So I started, I was like, the minimum I could do is I could order books, buy books, sift yeah. through books, just do the research side. And yeah. within a day or two of that adventure, Stacey, I'm sitting reading my husband a Todd Parr. I love Todd Parr books. They're just bright and awesome. And I'm reading it to him. And I was like, you know what someone needs to do? I'm all angry. Someone needs to. And I'm flipping those pages and I'm telling him what someone ought to write. And I realize out of my mouth yes. is the book. So I pause and I get my phone. And I turn on voice memo and I tell him angrily again. <laughs> and that's, that's where the children's book came out. I went and put it in Google Slides. I got rejected quite a bit in the illustration space because in case anyone wants to write a children's book, uh, they liked four to six months notice and I was giving them four to six weeks. So they all thought I made a typo. I didn't make a typo. <laughs> so I almost quit my search there because they were all like, you didn't give us enough time. And, and this is like, like February, March. And I want my book out in May because May is National Foster Care Month. Yes. And so I felt that nudge. Try one more day. Just try one more day. And I did. And I found a firm. They were a third of the price and they turned everything around in two weeks. Oh my gosh. And what was the name of the book in case somebody wants to find it? Yeah, it's called Are You a Forever Family? And the families that are illustrated in the book are real families that I know. So they're all based on real people. So we celebrate who forever families are. There's a lesson plan that goes with it for, as I mentioned earlier in the, the thread here, uh, K through five students. So what, what my goal there, Cece, is, is making adoption a normal conversation. Yeah. We talk about everything else from a diversity standpoint. We, we overlook adoption. Like, and I know some kids don't even know they're adopted, but if we could just make it a healthy conversation, I got to be part of piloting the lesson last year in a kindergarten classroom here in St. Louis County. And it was the sweetest thing for this little girl to raise her hand as we're kicking off the lesson. Teacher, I'm adopted. Aww. And this little boy next to her goes, well, why? And the teacher's like, we're going to get to that. And, you know, does her teachery thing. And the little yeah. girl raises her hand again, Stacey. Teacher, I want to share why. Kindergartner. She knew her whole story. She knew it. She said, I was in a country where families couldn't have a lot of kids. Oh. And my mom here wanted to have a baby. So she adopted me. And in the book, I highlight different demographics. So there is the single parent. There is the grandma. There is the couple. There's same-sex couple. There's all different kinds. Like There's the empty nesters. And so when we got to the page, she loved it. She's like, that's me. That's me. Oh, and think and about how yeah, how powerful that is to have representation. I mean, we talk a lot about representation and I love that you're making that so much more accessible as well as you know, my own personal story being donor conceived. You know, we shouldn't be ashamed of who we are and where we came from. And until we normalize some of these different ways of coming into the world, uh, it creates a sense of lesson. So you are changing yes. lives, you're changing that narrative. Yes. And it makes it a normal conversation. I mean, so many of the kids in the classroom, they knew people that adopted pets, right? We, we all kind of know that moment, but to give it language to kids. And then you had, I loved that. Like there was like a little group of like three or four girls on the side. And they were like, when I get bigger, I'm going to adopt. And I was like, yes, yes. Oh, <laughs> that's sweet. It is. Well, I feel like we could talk forever. I have one more question. And then I'm like, and then I need to somehow try to wrap this up. But what's going through my head is like, Okay, so you have published books, you have created a children's book, you have launched this nonprofit, you've become Mrs. Ohio. I mean, you've done so much already. You've been on Kelly Clarkson, I mean, the most important, if we're being honest. No, I'm just I'm half kidding. <laughs> um, you know, what's next? How are you going to continue to change these lives? Because I know you well enough to know that you're, you're just scratching the surface. You're just beginning, even though I've just listed things that people would dream of doing. Yeah. Well, and I think you're exactly right. I mean, what I'm trying to do is scale, right? And that's, I, I took my living room to the nation through a book. Yeah. Now I'm, my kids, the, the lesson plan is because when my kids were in elementary school, there wasn't language. And my son, it was very apparent to me during the pandemic, he could write a paper on any topic. He's in fifth grade. He yeah. decides he wants to write about foster care adoption. I just come out with my first book. So he's like so pumped, but he Googles and there's hard jargon online. Like you can't understand it. It's not written to a fifth grader. And so he gets stuck and the teacher's like, sweetie, you can just switch topics. And he goes, 
no, I can't. This is my story. Like letting my peers not understand. So part of what's next, I don't know when this is coming, Stacey, but I see a middle school version of my lesson plan coming. Um, I'm working, right. I worked a couple Girl Scouts on the initial one. And so we're looking at middle schools and faith communities. And I don't know when or which order, but those are brewing in my heart. I mentioned I'm in the middle of a research study. The themes from that, I just downloaded some pretty cool software. And because I'm a graduate, from Maryville University, where I still have access to my email. I checked their alumni office. I got to get a student discount on some really expensive software. Oh, so like, wow. that was a cool benefit this week. So I'm, I'm going to be working. I, I'm going to have a white paper and some outcomes from that, that I'm hoping influence one, the country as a whole. And really the, the big goal, if I go back to that phrase, like God-sized dream here, the, the, the overarching goal here, Stacey, is that I, I don't know. I was born thinking in efficiency. Okay. How do I do yeah. this faster? How do I free up more time? How do I do the things I want by getting that done? Right. Yeah. Okay. Then you meet the foster care system, <laughs> which is like okay. molasses. Yeah. Well, and what's molasses about it is that every uh, state, county and city and agency might do it different because so Stacey, if you're in Denver, which I know you have some relationships and I'm in St. Louis, we don't usually play together. And so usually what that means in the space is that if I have maybe a kid that needs to be adopted and you have a family licensed, we're not partnering. Oh, wow. And that is all over the entire nation. And so I have let go of the idea that I can make it efficient. Okay. I, I can't make the system efficient. Like I could, but I could see myself in 20 years moving the needle, not even a millimeter and being really frustrated. So I've let go of like that even happening. And if somebody wants to do that, that's your dream, do it. And I'm sorry that like, I'm not doing it. I'll help you. But that, I don't feel called to do that. What I feel called to do is to help streamline how the country understands this process. Because if I can teach everyone in the country, this is a choice that you can, you can do, like you can go do this tomorrow. It doesn't, it actually isn't even a financial question because the cost is zero to $25 per kid and the health insurance is covered. So you're not making a I can't afford to adopt a kid question. Yes. You're, you're asking yourself, can I take time to learn about these kids? Can I take time to help them process their wounds? Can I take time to be a parent? Like those yes. are the questions that are asked. And so my, my real big dream is leveraging some digital marketing better and being able to reach people more effectively to teach you and me, this is what the process is like. Yeah. Yes, it sucks. Yes, you're going to be frustrated. And yes, you're going to have to make more phone calls and emails than you ever thought you'd have to. But <laughs> this is how you do it. Yeah. So that's the dream. So if someone's listening and hears you say that and thinks, I want to help Marcy, what she's doing is changing lives. How do they reach out to you and how do they connect with you to help you accomplish all the amazing things you've already done and are going to continue to do? If that's you, hello. I'm so glad that you've been listening. This is great. Uh, all of my social accounts are public on purpose because I want people to, and even if like, if you're someone listening and you're like, I've been thinking about this. I have some questions and I don't know who to ask. Like, that's why all my accounts are public because they're there. I know this is a very personal decision and it's very private. Like you don't usually tell everyone you're thinking about this. And so I'm, I'm your confident, confidential person, but I'm on LinkedIn. I'm on Facebook. I'm on Instagram. You just look at Marcy Bursack. My website's forgottenadoptionoption.com. Super easy. I'm so happy to partner. And if, yeah, if you have digital marketing skills, that's really an area where I'm trying to create more strategy. But to me, it's it's how can we effectively leverage technology to catapult things? I'm not trying to say, let's make this my full-time job. What I'm trying to do is how, how can we do little things that make big impact and how can we do it together? Because there's so much stuff right now that it's like, we can automate so much of this. Yes. Oh, Whew. I'm going to walk away so charged up and inspired the rest of the day. I love you. So I love your energy. And so, of course, we need to get to the signature question, which is, you know, what would you put on your coffee mug that someone could wake up every day and read? What would be that that message that as they're drinking their coffee, they would see? I think the message that is in my mind almost every day, it's a little bit different. But what I would put in the coffee cup is remember your why. And I know we use this in so many places for so many things, but I think it drives us. I, I have something called a power statement. There's many different like personal mission statements. I have one that I actually, it used to be something we think about like New Year's resolutions. Like you write one for the year and that's like your thing. And one, one of the first years I did it within like 10 months, everything was done on it. And I was like, um, I kind of need goals. <laughs> like this is weird. So I've allowed myself to adapt it. I've allowed myself to iterate throughout the year. And now I've gotten to the point that I record myself an audio message so I can just listen to it in the car. I can listen to my power statement instead of having to read because it gets, you know, kind of daunting sometimes. Yes. But, and to me, that's how I remember my why. Like I call out like this is what I'm called to do. And then I specifically these are my goals. Like 
I'm trying to go to bed by this time. I'm trying to show up as this kind of mom. And then I break it down to like, on this day, I'm trying to do that. On this day, so like I just presented at a conference for Missouri early educators, early childhood educators. And so that was on there. On this day, I'm going with this person to present on this. And it's like, my year has key, my, and it's like five. It's not like a huge, huge list. But it's specific things that I'm like, this is something I'm doing. And this is important to me. And I think because of that, Stacey, to kind of weave our whole conversation together, I, because in my power statement, it calls out things that I'll do in the future. It helps me start thinking through, well, when I go to that speaking engagement or when I show up there, what do I want to bring to people? Whether that's what am I wearing or what am I saying or what am I, what am I giving away? Right. Like those things, I can spend so much more time thinking through more thoughtfully the future than like, oh my gosh, that's tomorrow. I didn't prepare, you know? So just remember your why. Yeah. And my biggest takeaway from this conversation is that you so clearly from where I'm sitting live with intention. Yes. Which I think speaks volumes of why so many things are able to happen Mm. because you're not being reactive. You're, you're really setting out with intention and it shows and it shows the impact. And I think whether you're trying to change the world like you or whether you have a business I really do think that takeaway of living and operating and running your business with intention just has such a bigger impact. So I'm just so thankful and honored that you took the time to be in this conversation and really appreciate you and can't wait to continue to watch you and be your biggest fan from afar. So thank you, Marcy. So fun. You're so welcome. But I think what you just said goes back to what we're talking about, right? Like what kind of, you can have intention wide. And kind of do lots of things, or you can have intention narrow and narrow can be like one to three, like you can do a few things really well. It's just when we stretch ourselves that maybe we're not seeing the same sort of intentionality or impact. Yes. Oh, perfect words to end on. Thank you. See you all next.